On September 26, 2022, three devastating explosions erupted along the underwater Nord Stream pipelines, sending an estimated 300,000 tons of hazardous methane gas surging into the Baltic Sea. The resulting mass of bubbles at the water surface was so large that it could be seen from space. Whoa! Almost immediately, it was determined to be an act of international sabotage, with many countries pointing the finger towards Russia. After all, Nord Stream were Russian pipes, and Russian President Vladimir Putin wasn't the most popular person at the party following his invasion of Ukraine in February of that year. But why would Russia sabotage their own pipeline? Something didn't add up. While award-winning journalist Seymour Hirsch believes he's finally cracked the case, and if true, you won't believe who done it. So investigators, buckle up as we try to unfurl who was really to blame for blowing up the Nord Stream pipelines. Before we dive straight in, let's do a quick debrief as to what the Nord Stream pipeline actually is. It's a huge 750 mile network of offshore underwater pipelines used to transport natural gas from Russia into Germany. The first pipe, Nord Stream 1, began construction back in 1997 and was completed in May 2011. And just like that, 1.9 trillion cubic feet of gas could be safely transported into Germany 24 hours a day, 365 days a year to accommodate all their energy needs. Nord Stream 1 was so successful that work immediately began on producing a second pipeline, imaginatively named Nord Stream 2. This doubled the already vast volume of gas being transported between the two countries. Russia would make more money selling their resources and Germany had a reliable source of gas to cover its energy needs. What's more, Germany could sell on any gas they didn't need for a nice little kickback. Everyone's happy, right? Yeah, not quite. See, the whole Nord Stream project has been steeped in controversy, which has somewhat muddied the political waters. Pun intended. A lot of big Western powers felt that Russia had ulterior motives for funding the Nord Stream network. It massively increased European dependence on Russian energy, so they suspected that one day, Russia might use that to their advantage and weaponize the energy network using their powerful position as the leading European energy supplier as leverage. Lo and behold, February 2022 comes around, Russia invades Ukraine, and that's exactly what happened. European nations had become so reliant on that cheap Russian gas that they were scared of getting too involved in the conflict in case Russia decided to switch off their supplies. Plus, the invasion caused energy prices across Europe to skyrocket, and all that money was going towards funding Russia's war effort. It goes without saying that whilst the cost of power was shooting through the roof, opinions towards Russia were cascading through the floor. So come September 26, when Danish and Swedish authorities announced three explosions had destroyed parts of the Nord Stream pipe network, Russia was the obvious prime suspect. Russian submarines had been spotted patrolling the areas near where the leaks had been discovered and explosive residue had been found on a number of objects seized from the site. Sheesh. Can you imagine the state of that blown up pipe as it was hauled out of the water? However, after a thorough investigation into the incident, German investigators concluded that there was no decisive proof of Russian involvement. Huh? No shot. Honestly, anyone with half a brain could see that Russia had no logical reason to destroy the network. While Putin liked to think he had Europe in the palm of his hand, the truth was he still needed those euros to finance the war. See, energy giant Gazprom, who are part-owned by the Russian government, control a 51% majority share in the Nord Stream pipeline. The other 49% is split between four other companies throughout Europe. Because Gazprom is owned by the Russian regime, whenever the company makes money, the government makes money too. And they made a butt-ton of money. Some estimates guess it's almost half of Russia's eye-watering $384 billion annual budget. Yikes. Now, not all of that money's from the Nord Stream pipeline, but you can see why they'd be invested in keeping it open, right? So if the Russians didn't blow it up then, who did? Was it a desperate defense by Ukraine or an aggressive move by other EU member states? Well, award-winning American journalist Seymour Hirsch has his own ideas. 
Hirsch believes the three explosions weren't caused by Vladimir Putin, but by none other than President Joe Biden and the United States government. Wait, what? Oh, you heard me, and I'm about to tell you why. But first, if you're enjoying this video, then why not show a little love to those like and subscribe buttons down below? It's the only way to keep up to date with all of my incredible fact videos. Great job. Now we've got a super secret mission to get back to. Where was I? Oh, right, this Hirsch guy. Who does he think he is, throwing around such wild accusations? Well, he's actually quite a big deal. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1970 for exposing horrific atrocities conducted by US soldiers in Vietnam and the government's subsequent attempts to sweep it all under the rug. Since then, he's covered countless catastrophic failures by the US government, from the unlawful invasion of Iraq back in 2003 to the use of airstrikes on innocent Syrian civilians in 2014. What I'm saying is, he's been right before. Not about everything, but enough that his name carries weight. So when he published an article in February 2023 claiming the US government perpetrated the Nord Stream sabotage and detailing exactly how they carried the attack out, it turned more than a couple heads. According to Hirsch, one of the most devastating instances of international sabotage Europe has seen in recent years went down like this. In January 2021, just before Joe Biden's inauguration as President of the United States, Republican Senator Ted Cruz pushed a bill pressuring the new president into passing sanctions on the soon-to-be-completed Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Cruz and his allies rightly felt the new pipeline would give Putin too much power over Europe, but that wasn't their only concern. See, Russia weren't the only ones trying to sell natural gas. The more Germany and Western Europe became reliant on cheap Russian gas, the less they wanted American gas, and the big dogs in Washington weren't happy about that. They were even less happy when roughly a month or so later, reports emerged stating Russian troops were partaking in large-scale exercises on the Ukrainian border. With the second pipeline almost finished and the threat of war looking very real, the US felt they had to do something. The only question was, what? See, there was one big problem. The US had an agreement to minimize direct conflict with Russia, so whatever they did had to be done in secret. And secret is exactly what they did. Let's jump forward to December 2021, two months before the first tanks rolled into Ukraine. United States National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan organized a secret meeting in a small top floor room of the old executive office building next to the White House. In attendance were key figures from the CIA, State and Treasury Departments, including Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland. All of them were publicly outspoken against the Nord Stream gas system. In this secret meeting, there was just one item on the agenda. How do they put an end to Nord Stream? Many plans were put forward, but it wasn't until director of the CIA, William Burns, mentioned having connection to the Navy's deep sea diving school in Panama City, Florida, that things were really set in motion. Divers at the school are trained to technical dive using C4 explosives to clear harbors and beaches of debris and unexploded ordnance. Basically, if someone finds a big unexploded bomb in or around a beach, these are the guys who dispose of it. At least that's part of what they do. They also assist in covert underwater operations. Back in 1971, America intercepted a Russian communication cable buried deep in the Sea of Okhotsk. The cable relayed messages between a regional Navy command and the mainland headquarters at Vladivostok. Under the codename Operation Ivy Bells, a team of Navy divers were dispatched to place a listening device on the cable that intercepted the Russian communications and recorded their messages. This mission rolled on for a whole decade, providing invaluable intelligence on enemy movements and was only foiled because former National Security Agency employee Ronald Pelton sold information to Russian intelligence. Because of this mission, the room agreed that the Navy divers were the right people for the job, but there was still one big concern. Remember that US agreement not to aggravate Russia I mentioned earlier? Funnily enough, getting highly trained tactical divers to swim down and place explosives along a multi-billion dollar pipeline was in total jeopardy of that agreement. Ever heard someone say, don't poke a sleeping bear? Yeah, don't strap C4 to one either. If there was any way to trace this plan back to the US, it would be an absolute disaster. They needed a trustworthy ally on board to facilitate access to the Baltic Sea, where the pipelines are, and they knew just who to ask for help. 
It's often said the best place to hide is in plain sight. And according to Hirsch, that's pretty much what America did. In fact, he claims that had it not been for the assistance of Norway, which shares a border with Russia, the plan wouldn't have gone ahead. See, America's military presence in Norway has grown steadily for a number of years. During that time, they've invested billions of dollars setting up a new American submarine base in the country and expanding a Norwegian air base, all suspiciously close to, you guessed it, the big R. Norway also has its own gas supply, so the destruction of Nord Stream would give them an opportunity to become a big player in Europe. Basically, it was in their best interest to assist the US. So the Norwegians provided the US with a crucial tip-off regarding the best place to plant the C4. A few miles off Denmark's Bornholm Island in the Baltic Sea, the pipelines run through an area where the water is only 260 feet deep and there are no major tidal currents. In other words, good diving conditions. The divers would sail over on a Norwegian Alta-class mine hunter, a small warship used to remove or detonate naval mines. Then they'd dive down, plant the explosives, and get out again. It sounds easy, but don't be fooled. This was tedious, time-consuming, and dangerous work. Plus, if Danish authorities picked up on their nefarious goings-on, it'd blow the cover on the entire operation. This wasn't just an attack on Russia, but a betrayal to all the European nations who relied on the gas from the Nord Stream network, including vital US allies. Jeez. So it was paramount nobody found out. And to ensure this, the US needed a distraction to help the divers go unnoticed. Luckily for them, the perfect distraction was just a few weeks away. You see, every June since 1971, the US Navy's Sixth Fleet have held a big military event where troops from North America and allied European countries all come together and partake in various water-based training exercises. Can you guess where they do it? Yep, the Baltic Sea. The upcoming event named Baltops 22 would be all the cover they needed. So, as well as the usual military exercises, a new one was added that took place off the coast of Bornholm Island bomb planting and disposal. It was an ingenious cover. Whilst everybody else partook in the military exercise, the Panama City divers could plant the real C4 and leave the scene before anybody was the wiser. Talk about sneaky. Once the explosives were set, the last hurdle was how to detonate them. If the C4 were to explode in the days or weeks following Baltops 22, it could raise suspicion towards the White House. To avoid this problem, engineers developed a release on the explosives that would only charge after receiving a unique sound cue. This sound had to be totally distinguishable from the ambient noises of the ocean, otherwise they'd risk one of the bombs going off prematurely. Okay, so what can emit this unique sound? Well, a special type of sonar buoy can. A plane was to fly overhead on short notice and drop the buoy over the area. Once in place, it'd release a unique audio key that would be picked up by the receivers on the bombs and activate the timers. And on September 26, around 2 a.m. local time, the detonation order was given. Three explosions went off along separate areas of Nord Stream 1 and 2, quickly polluting the surrounding area with toxic gases. Seems like Biden finally got what he wanted. The plan went off without a hitch. Not only was the pipeline network destroyed, but everyone immediately started blaming Russia. Job done and dusted. Only, was it? Hear me out. For a super secret covert operation steeped in silence, why do we know so much about it? Who spilled the beans? Well, turns out Big Mouth Biden might have dropped the ball before the Russian invasion had even started when he said this at a press conference back in early February 2022. If, uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. What do, what, how, will you, how will you do that exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. That seems like the final nail in the coffin, right? You literally heard the words from Sleepy Joe's mouth. And that knowing smile is, well, it's quite something. Surely that's a wrap. 
Now hold on, before you go flying off the handle, let's put our thinking caps on for just a minute. I didn't bring you on board to believe any old garbage. It's time to dig into the real nitty gritty bits of information. In order to determine if Hirsch's claims carry any weight, we need to know where he got all this information. I mean, there's so much detail that it must have come from someone deeply involved in the plan, right? Could it be someone who was in that first meeting at the executive office building? Well, that's the problem. We don't know. When it comes to who told Hirsch all these tiny details about the Panama divers, like which boat was used and the specific kind of sonar buoy that was dropped, his lips are tight shut. In fact, all he said is there one person who it seems knows a lot about what's going on. Hmm, that's really suspicious. And I can't stress how important this is. All these intricate little moving parts could have been leaked to Hirsch by Jake Sullivan himself, sure, but for all we know, there's an equal chance they came from Crazy Jerry, Hirsch's old racquetball partner who smells like boiled eggs and sleeps with his pet tortoise. I know what you're thinking. Come on, this guy's an award-winning journalist. He's not gonna lie about this, is he? Honestly, I don't know. What I do know is this isn't a one-off. Hirsch has been criticized a number of times for failing to identify where he gets his information. It's always an unnamed former official said this or an unidentified secret document passed to me told me that. Basically, a lot of what he writes is reinforced by non-divulgable sources. And on the off chance it is Crazy Jerry whispering sweet nothings in his ear, I'd suggest taking this with a pinch of salt. On the other hand, is it really surprising that Hirsch keeps their identity secret? The US government has a terrible track record with how they treat people who expose their legitimate corruptions. Remember Ronald Pelton from earlier? He was charged with espionage for betraying the government and given three life sentences plus an extra 10 years in jail for selling information to the Russians. Whether you think he deserved it or not, that's up to you. But Pelton wasn't an isolated case. Back in 2013, infamous whistleblower Edward Snowden released classified information about the government's illegal spying tactics and mass surveillance programs. How did they respond? Yeah, they tried to charge him under the Espionage Act too. The same goes for Australian journalist Julian Assange for leaking classified documents provided by former US soldier turned whistleblower Chelsea Manning. The documents in question detailed the government's extensive human rights violations during the Iraq War. Manning, too, got the same treatment. Do you see the pattern? If you speak up about the government's illegal activities, they're gonna do everything within their power to punish you for it. So it's not impossible that Hirsch is trying to protect those brave enough to speak up. However, the unignorable facts are that Hirsch's mysterious single source apparently had a hand in every microscopic detail of the plan. And many of these details, some minor, some major, are undeniably false. Yeah. First, remember when he said Norway would benefit from the destruction of the pipeline by selling their own gas? Yeah, the fact is, they haven't. Their gas exports have stayed pretty much exactly the same since the explosion. Wouldn't you expect them to capitalize on the big hole they just helped blow in the market? I know I would. Secondly, Hirsch claimed the boat the divers deployed from was a Norwegian Alta-class mine hunter, but no Alta-class mine hunters were in action on that day during Baltops 22. Huh. Hirsch later changed his story to say the ship was called the Alta, but that can't have been true either. The Alta had been docked at the Hakansmer Naval Base since November 2012, and its precise location can be seen via satellite imagery the whole time. Hmm. But I know what you're thinking. So what? They used a different boat, Big Whoop. The thing is, Hirsch might have been wrong about the buoy dropping plane too. GPS maps have shown that no planes capable of dropping a sonar buoy were flying remotely close to any of the explosion sites at the time of the blast. The, of course, the GPS could have been tampered with. Hirsch seems to think the US government spent months planning this mission, so it seems unlikely they'd fumble it by forgetting to switch the darn tracker off. Even so, the article is chock full of inconsistencies in the tiny details that just don't add up. On the one hand, Hirsch could be taking extra steps to protect the identity of the leaker. On the other hand, he could be straight up wrong. And if so, that's got pretty damning consequences for the legitimacy of the entire story. The sheer extent of detail in the article is what gives Hirsch's arguments any way to begin with. Without it, the whole thing's a house of cards waiting to fall apart. 
If parts of it are untrue, which seems to be the case, then it might as well all be untrue. Hirsch doesn't prove Biden did anything, but that also doesn't mean he's definitely wrong. You're gonna have to make up your own mind on this one. But before you do, there's one more piece of evidence I think you should consider. On November 6, 2015, nearly seven years before all this, a Seafox drone was found lying next to the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. Seafox are remotely operated vehicles designed to destroy naval mines, and the one in question was armed with a live explosive which had failed to detonate. No way. Had someone tried to blow the pipeline up all the way back then? Well, no. The drone belonged to the Swedish Armed Forces who claimed the steering cable had got damaged during a military exercise, causing the vehicle to lose control and veer off course. If that happens, the explosive is automatically disarmed. At the time, it was written off as nothing suspicious. That is, until the sabotage of the pipeline in 2022, when Russian media sites began circulating the image of the Seafox drone as evidence of previous sabotage attempts. Russia said it was proof that NATO countries were plotting against them. NATO is an alliance between North American and European governments to defend one another if any of them are attacked, and Russia has always disapproved of it. Only in 2015, Sweden wasn't even part of NATO. They only applied for membership after Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022. So is there any truth behind Russia's claims, or are they just playing the victim? Oh boy, we've really come full circle. And if I'm honest, I don't feel any closer to uncovering the truth of the matter. Let me restate that Hirsch's argument can't be trusted. Having said that, it doesn't necessarily mean he's incorrect. But the way he arrives at his conclusion is unfounded and imprecise. You heard it here first, kids. Don't trust it. And remember that German report saying there was no evidence of Russia sabotaging their own pipes? Yeah, that don't mean squat. All it says is nothing currently proves they did it, not that they definitely didn't. Look, politics is a grubby game. There's a lot of conversations and dirty handshakes going on behind closed doors that you and I don't know about. But for now, unless you buy into Seymour Hersh's claim, the identity of the real culprits who masterminded the Nord Stream pipeline attacks remains shrouded in mystery. Maybe one day we'll uncover who was really responsible. Then again, maybe we won't. In the meantime, I'm gonna change my name, accent, and next of kin details. You bet your bottom dollar someone out there is watching my every move. Beep. And with that, we've made it to the end of the video. Do you think Hirsch really solved the mystery, or is something else at play here? Leave a comment below letting me know what you think, and if you've got any other ideas who done it, then let me know those too. Thanks for watching.